St. Kitts and Nevis general elections kick off with 48,000 eligible to vote. The United Nations calls for action to stop attacks on civilians in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the Vice President of Zimbabwe's Movement for Democratic Change Alliance detained as battle for the control of the opposition movement deepens. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo in Quito, Ecuador. This is from Mesa. Police in Zimbabwe have arrested the Vice President of the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance, Tendai Biti. Biti and five other party officials were arrested in the capital, Harare, after the, they attempted to force their way into the party headquarters, which is currently occupied by a rival faction of the opposition party. The party has been divided since the country's Supreme Court ruled that party president Nelson Shamisa was a not its legitimate leader and installed Toko Sani Kupe, head of the faction, inside the party to lead it in the interim in the world, one government in the world, in the affairs, in the affairs, in the affairs of a private voluntary organization. And you, you send the army, you send the army. On Friday, South Africa's ruling party, the African National Congress, ANC, launched an anti-racism campaign in solidarity with protests in the United States over the death of George Floyd. The Black Friday campaign will call on South Africans to wear black every Friday for an, uh, for an as yet unspecified period of time. This will serve to highlight the continued prevalence of racism and police brutality in the world. A statement by the party described racism as a blight of the soul of the world. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, has claimed victory in a COVID-19 related labor matter after the country's labor court dismissed an application launched by a steel manufacturer to stop workers from striking during the COVID-19 pandemic. Workers at Max Steel Group have been on strike since May 28th after management cut their salaries by 20%, citing financial difficulties caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Max Steel had approached the labor court to interdict the strike. We are vindicated by this court judgment. It found in our favor. It found that the decision taken by Max Steel management to cut salaries for the months of May, June, and July by 20% was indeed a, um, a change in the terms of and conditions. It found that Max Steel management did not consult, and this was, was a unilateral decision. And therefore, on the basis of this, the strike that our members have embarked on is a legal strike, it is a protected strike, it is a lawful strike. The United Nations has expressed concern at the increase in the number of attacks on civilians by armed groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo. UN Human Rights High Commissioner said some of the attacks may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. I call on the authorities to do their utmost to introduce or expand the presence of security forces in the areas of conflict to ensure they protect civilians rather than prey on them. Protection of civilians is the responsibility of the state, and when the state leaves a vacuum, it puts these communities at great risk. In the RC, past experience shows this can have catastrophic results. Some of these attacks and killings of civilians in the eastern provinces may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. I was appalled by the atrocities I heard firsthand from these civilians in the camp of Bunia. Children, mothers brutally attacked, wounded, maimed, and killed. These people are being chased from their homes, fleeing the armed groups, and receiving no protection from the military and police forces who have also committed grave violations. Ethiopia received over 500,000 masks and other medical supplies as a donation from five Chinese companies and the Dongwang municipal government on Tuesday. Local authorities said the donation will play a critical role in helping the city of Addis Ababa overcome the challenges posed by COVID-19. The support between our two countries is mutual, not one way or one country at the receiving end. We support each other. So from above, we can see that the relationship between China and Ethiopia is really what our two governments called 
comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. It is strategic as it will make a difference in our development, as its significance goes beyond bilateral. We aim to make our cooperation a model for China-Africa cooperation. We're very grateful to the Chinese government, people, and institutions for your support. We should take the necessary COVID-19 precautions, but if the worst is to come, it is obvious that we need ventilators and ambulances. We hope your support will continue until Ethiopians triumph the fight against COVID-19. Forces loyal to Libya's internationally recognized government captured the last major stronghold of renegade General Khalifa Haftar near Tripoli on Friday, keeping the sudden collapse of his 14-month offensive on the capital. According to military sources, Haftar's forces have been forced to withdraw from the town of Tarhuna following days of clashes with government of National Accord troops. The advance by GNA forces has reversed many of Haftar's gains from last year when he launched the offensive to wrestle control of Tripoli from the GNA. I am sending a message to the countries who support the aggression and who helped kill Libyans and destroy the country, telling them that your bid has failed and we will sue you after you have tasted defeat at the doors of Tripoli. We will always stay loyal to the blood of our martyrs and the sacrifice of our heroes. Hence our decision not to sit on the table with a war criminal because he has never been a partner in the political process or the peace process. Palestinians in the occupied on a Friday rally not to mark 53 years of Israeli occupation and protests against the Jewish state's plans to annex part of the territory. Dozens of demonstrators waved Palestinian flags and chanted slogans against Israeli settlements and the plans, which could move ahead as early as uh, next month. Protests also took place in the West Bank cities of Ramallah, Hebron, and Nablus. We are here today to take a stand, wherein the Palestinian people embody a commitment to their inalienable rights on the memory of the 53rd Palestinian Nazca. The residents of Beit Hanun are here to assure that they are keen on returning to their homes. This march shows a rejection of any plan of settlement or annexation, and on the anniversary of the Naxa, we've been saying since 1967, this is our land and we will defend it with all our power and energy. We call for this demonstration to reject the annexation plan, especially in the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea. We'll be right back, don't go away. In St. Kitts and Nevis, citizens have begun voting in general elections held amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris cast his ballot early as polls opened at 7 a.m. and are set to close at 6 p.m. He's seeking a second term in office as his team, Unity Party, secured seven of the 11 seats in the 2015 elections. His main opponent, Dr. Denzel Douglas, hopes to reclaim a leadership of the country. Dr. Douglas is the longest serving Prime Minister from 1995 to 2015. Meanwhile, 48,000 people have registered to vote in this year's election. One voter representing the Diabetes Association has said that while the voting process appeared to be smooth, he hopes provisions have been made for those who suffer from the non-communicable disease. I got here about 15 minutes ago and I realized that large quantities of people here to vote. You know, as usual, wearing my hat as the PRO of the Diabetes Association, my concern would always be the waiting time for some of the diabetics, especially those who are insulin dependent and who would be subject to significant fluctuations in their blood sugar levels. Time of eating, based upon the, the duration of their work here, based upon the bright sunshine that would have its own impact. And so that would be my concern. Basically, those are factors that I would hope people would have borne in mind when they would have been coming out and hopefully would have prepared adequately for that. To speak more about the elections in St. Kitts and Nevis is News Director for SKN News, Andrew Huey. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Hi, thanks for having me. 
So 40,000 people are eligible to vote. How has the voter turnout been in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, so far we've, we've seen a very, uh, what appears to be a high turnout. Uh, most of the polling stations we've visited today, even to this afternoon, has had a large turnout of, of voters. Um, we've uh, seen where in some cases where, uh, you know, the lines are, are long, pretty long lines, you know, from the polling station to um, even the entrance of the, the location where you go to vote. So we've had some pretty long lines. We've seen cases where, you know, persons have worn their, their masks. Some instances, um, the one polling division we visited, you know, um, there were quite a few people who didn't have on their masks, um, basically not observing the, the COVID-19 regulations. Uh, it's, it appeared as business normal in some instances, but we did have quite a few uh, persons who wore their masks and ensure that they um, abide by the COVID-19 regulations. Now, have there been any reports of irregularities in the voting process? They haven't, we have not had any complaints. I mean, I've spoken to candidates, um, some of the candidates on, on both sides, and they've basically reported that voting um, had gone through, you know, for the most part, quite normally. Um, there, were, there weren't any issues. However, prior to today, I mean, yesterday, the opposition party, the St. Kitts Labour Party, had um, sought to get um, some names that were removed from the voters list restored. Um, they didn't have enough time, and that was what the court essentially had ruled. They didn't manage to get some of the names on the list, but uh, majority of the names were not restored. And so I'm sure that's something that they would probably be pressed, uh, depending on the results after tonight's, after today's election. But um, prior to this time, there had been pretty um, seamless process. Um, I mean, most of the polling stations we visited, um, they, they have been, you know, a smooth process. There, there wasn't any challenges whatsoever as it pertains to the voting process itself today. Now, um, for our international viewers, could you just uh, briefly explain the differences in political uh, philosophies between Dr. Timothy Harris and his main opponent, Dr. Denzel Douglas? Right. Well, the, the Labour Party overall, the, their philosophy has always been to uh, look out for the working class. I mean, that's what they've, they've championed and, and contested the elections on over the, over the years. Uh, since they've started. They're the oldest political organization, one of the oldest in the Caribbean and, and certainly um, the oldest here in St. Kitts Nevis. For Team Unity, um, it, it was an unprecedented situation in the, in the sense that uh, this was an am amalgamation of three political parties, three political movements in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so the idea when Team Unity was elected in 2015 was to combine um, the, the majority of the, well, to combine the interest of the major political parties on both St. Kitts and Nevis with the goal of creating a government of national unity. So you had Dr. Harris who came from the Labour Party teaming up with the then main opposition People's Action Movement. And then on Nevis you had the Concerned Citizens Movement, um, which was, was in opposition on the federal level. So those ideas coming together was to create a government of national unity and to try to achieve some of the objectives that they felt were lacking at the time. So those say are the two primary differences between the two the two parties um when can we expect official results well traditionally in St. Kitts and Nevis election results usually we don't get the full results until the, the following morning um the count will start uh, after the polls close at six and and all the ballot boxes go to the central location in the so each constituency has a central polling station that all the boxes will go to uh, for that constituency, and then the count will start then. Um, usually it goes late in the night, even though they, it's not a large number of voters registered compared to some countries. Um, we usually don't get the result until the following morning. Um, what we understand is that usually there are, are multiple recounts done um, when the final uh, counts are done, and so so that persons are, that both parties are satisfied that they have um, counted the ballots and that the, the accurate count is reflecting in the number that's given to the supervisor of election. So usually that takes some time um, because, you know, recounts are done several times before you actually get to a final count. So um, we don't expect results before midnight tonight. And hopefully we'll get the results uh, before um, dawn tomorrow morning. Now, Andrea, how would you say the results of this election um, affect the Caribbean and Latin America? Well, um, you know, any election results in, in, um, in especially in the CARICOM region, is, is, is quite impactful in terms of the relations of 
the government with the other countries in, in CARICOM. Uh, for St. Kitts Nevis, St. Kitts Nevis is a major player in, in the regional integration body. Um, you know, the, 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 the situation that, that we see happening um, with, I mean, if we look at the last election in 2015, um, there were some constitutional matters that uh, were very central to the the situation. Um, I beg your pardon, I just got a bit distracted. Um, right. There were matters pertaining to, um, you know, constitutional reform. Um, we had a, a, a motion of no confidence that was lingering for quite some time. And so CARICOM had an expressed interest in the outcome of that election. Considering now that this is actually the first election that we're having in the CARICOM region, on the COVID-19 regulations, um, certainly all eyes will be on St. Kitts Nevis um, from the other CARICOM brothers. So at least from that standpoint, um, I know it will certainly have an impact. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think that whatever the result is, whatever the outcome, the final outcome, uh, will be respected by, you know, the CARICOM partners, um, partners in CARICOM, and um, whichever government, uh, whichever leader emerges as the prime minister, uh, certainly will play a major role in whatever regional integration movement will take place here on after. Andrew, we thank you so much for your time for Telesur so English. We hope to have you soon again. Thank you. That was Andrew Huey, and we were speaking about general elections taking place in St. Kitts and Nevis. Moving on, in Puerto Rico, the president of the State Elections Commission, Juan Davila Rivera, officially submitted a request to the U.S. Department of Justice to hold a vote on the island's status. The initiative seeks authorization for $2.5 million to fund a yes or no to statehood referendum, which is promoted by the ruling pro-independence New Progressive Party. Puerto Rico has been subjected to U.S. colonial rule since 1898, and it has been a freely associated state since 1952. In 2016, the island acknowledged that its uh, government lacks sovereign power, as it made most of the world think for more than six decades. St. Lucia recorded one new imported case of the novel coronavirus after more than a month with zero active cases. This takes the total number of positives on the island to 19. 18 people have already recovered. From a batch of 23 tests conducted, there was one positive case of COVID-19. The individual is a 33-year-old female who is one of our nationals working on the cruise line. She was recently repatriated to St. Lucia and was placed in institutional quarantine as per national protocol. In keeping with the testing strategy for repatriated cruise line workers, she was swabbed to determine her COVID-19 status. Upon receiving the results confirming this case, the individual has now been placed in isolation for care and is doing well. The United States has reportedly threatened to withhold military assistance to Antigua and Barbuda over an unpaid loan. The Prime Minister made the declaration during Parliament on Tuesday. I asked the distinguished ambassador, you know, how do you expect us to pay that $25 million dollar, um, outstanding um, debt in terms of the arrears at a time when we can't even pay salaries and wages? And I said, not because we don't want to pay. <laughs> but we just don't have the resources. And the irony about it too is that they owe us for the WTO debt. And even though we ask them to do a set off against what they owe us, they are not looking at us. In fact, you know what they've done? During this time of COVID, the ambassador said to me, well, the US will withdraw all support, all military support that they give to the Antigua and Barbie Defense Force. These are the challenges that we have to deal with as a small nation. And then the very ambassador will ask me why we're so close to China. <laughs> now, I don't know if they want us to be self-sacrificing allies to take, and let's say, a hostile position against China, and then to literally eliminate that source of support. China has been the most supportive government to the people and gov the government of people of Antigua and Barbie for years. More stories coming up, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. More news now. Ecuador's Ministry of Defense has approved an agreement that would allow the armed forces to use lethal force against protesters. The Ombudsman Office has since requested the repeal of the proposal, saying it violates human rights. 
Ministerial Agreement 179 has entered the nation's official registry. The agreement would allow the Ecuadorian armed forces to progressively use lethal force against the people. Trying to control internal activities when you are not prepared to, it provokes a distortion on the role of the armed forces and violates human rights, mainly to people's lives, and would break restrictions on cruel and degrading treatment. Part of the agreement indicates that the armed forces may use force to repress gatherings, demonstrations, protests, and situations of internal violence that could result in serious calamities. It cannot be that when Ecuadorian workers protest, they are repressed. Neoliberalism wants to silence workers, and we already said we won't accept it. This is an evidence of the government's inability to solve economic and sanitary issues the country is facing. The scale to determine the appropriate use of force is classified in five levels, allowing, as a last option, the use of firearms with lethal ammunition to allegedly neutralize violent situations. If you take a gun and shoot it at a civilian, that's a murder. The progressive use of weapons is for the police, not for those who are trained for war. The police is the one that has specific crowd control tools like tear gas. In addition, the police also have all the necessary protective equipment. This ministerial agreement is coming out mere months after the popular uprising of October 2019, considered to be the most important in recent years in Ecuador. It also shows the popular rejection against the last economic measures as further mobilizations are already being planned. In Mexico, hundreds of people took to the streets of Jalisco to demand justice for the killing of Giovanni Lopez. Lopez was a construction worker who died after being violently arrested by police forces in the municipality of Ixtlahuacan for not using a face mask amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Protesters demand that the errant policemen be brought to justice. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on StarSat, Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And be sure to follow us on social media as well. For Telesur English, I am Stephanie Bravo. Until next time.